Hey, this is Travis again, and today I'm going to be taking you through the user journey of somebody onboarding to Web3 for the first time. And I've gone through the first several steps uh, onboarding to crypto with a centralized crypto exchange where you purchase your crypto, creating a Web3 wallet and transferring the crypto from the exchange into this Web3 wallet. I paused a little bit to talk about what is a Web3 wallet and why it might be scary for first time users and then took you in depth step by step to look at a send transaction um, or sending your crypto to another wallet and what that looks like. So now we're in the final step right now. We are going to actually really enter the Web3 ecosystem and use a decentralized application or a DApp. And when I say Web3 ecosystem, I'm talking about the universe of dApps. There are many different categories that are emerging, and this is the most exciting thing about Web3. We have decentralized finance, we have decentralized social media, digital identity, custodying your crypto media like art and other digital files in your Web3 wallet, GameFi, which is gaming finance. You can play video games and earn crypto this way. There are so many interesting projects that are coming out right now, and I'll cover this in other videos, not in this series. This series is specifically trying to give a foundation for what Web3 is, um, but just understand that we'll cover Web3 and at another time. But again, coming back to the foundations here, I wanna show you something crucial where you are connecting your Web3 wallet to a decentralized app. It's giving this app permission to look at some information in your wallet. It's not giving it access to your private key, otherwise the developers could steal your crypto, but it is allowing your wallet and the D app to communicate with one another and send transactions to the blockchain. So for the example, I'm going to demo uh, a decentralized app that it was one of the first that gained product market fit and especially in 2020 this is a it's within the category so if if d app is at the high level right and then if we go one down at the in the categories of d apps one category is decentralized finance this is where you can earn yield on your crypto and it's building out a lot of important token infrastructure which i'm going to show you here the first D app, one of the first to get product market fit and really get a lot of user adoption is something called Uniswap. And Uniswap allows you to, it's, it's called a decentralized exchange because it allows you to swap one token for another in a decentralized way. So at first, this doesn't seem like a very compelling use case because we can go on to these centralized exchanges and we can buy whatever token we want. So what is a decentralized exchange and why do we need it? Well, if you have token A and you want token B and a stranger on the internet has token B and he wants token A, then you can create a market between these two people, right? We have supply and demand on both sides the problem is trusting this stranger on the internet, especially when we're working with Web3 wallets that are anonymous, like who, no one knows that my identity is connected with this wallet, okay? So how do we do this in a way where we don't have to trust the other person? Because if, if he says, well, send me token A and then I'll send you token B, I'm gonna send him token A, he's not gonna send me token B, he's gonna run away with my crypto, okay? So we need some sort of functionality to facilitate this trade over the internet in an anonymous and what they call trustless way. Uh, so something that you don't need to have trust in. Now, uh, we could go a little deeper and think, well, maybe we want to ha uh, introduce an escrow service. So he puts in token B, I put in token A, and then the, es the third party escrow service does the swap for us. Um, this is introducing a, an intermediary back into the 
um, into this transaction, which doesn't need to be the case. So Uniswap and decentralized exchanges, they solve this problem by basically deploying this protocol. This is a smart contract protocol that they deploy to the Ethereum blockchain. And this software, this code is going to be facilitating the trade for us. So we don't have to trust any, any intermediary. We don't have to trust any escrow service. We don't even have to trust that the other person on the other end is going to act in a non-malicious way. We just actually trust the code that was deployed to Ethereum. And all of this code is publicly auditable. We can go into the Ethereum blockchain and audit this code line by line to make sure that it will do what we expect it to do. So this is what they mean by a trustless ecosystem when we talk about blockchains. Anyway, so I'm going to open up this app right here. And this is a big thing that a big, very common design pattern when in Web3 is something called connecting your wallet. In Web2, we're very used to putting in our username and password, usually an email address and a password that we've sent, or sorry, submitted. But in Web3, what you do is you connect your wallet to these decentralized applications. So I clicked connect wallet on the, on the front end of the decentralized app, and now MetaMask is coming up with a pop-up saying, which account do you want to connect? I'm gonna connect my first account. And then it says, do you want to give the this decentralized app, Uniswap, this URL right here, access to your address, account balance, activity, and suggest transactions? Yes, okay. And again, we're not giving Uniswap access to our private key. That would defeat the whole purpose of this. But we are allowing this D app to communicate with our wallet and so that we can send transactions to the blockchain and create more sophisticated transactions than just this the simple send transaction that we did in within MetaMask itself. So these decentralized apps are it's outsourcing creating transactions to do more sophisticated functionality within uh, on the blockchain. And again, this is the first use case right here. So I have Ethereum. Let's say I want to convert 0 0.005. Wait, I don't have that. 0 0.0005 Ethereum. And I want to swap that for a token called DAI. DAI, don't worry about what this is. This is just some random token out there. I'm sure you've heard that there are uh, many tokens out there that you can buy and DAI is, is called a stable coin and it's just another coin on the Ethereum network. So we have an exchange rate between DAI and ETH. I'll click swap right here. It's going to come up with some details. Slippage is kind of a complex topic that I won't cover here, but uh, right now just understand we're going from ETH to DAI. Confirm. So I click confirm on the Uniswap UI and again it brings up a MetaMask pop-up asking me to confirm this transaction. And this should look really familiar to the last video when we had a send transaction here. Um, it's, there's going to be a delay as we've looked at before and a network fee in order to use the Ethereum blockchain. And as you can see it's updating right here and that's because the network fee is changing over time. Every it looks like every about 10 seconds, the network fee updates. And um, yeah, so just understand that that's why this refreshing is happening. So I'm gonna click confirm, transaction submitted, add die to MetaMask. This is just gonna tell my wallet to look for die. And it looks like the transaction actually already went through. Let me open my wallet and see. Boom, okay. Yeah. So this multi-call right here is the uh, swap transaction. It's, it's called multi-call because it's calling multiple functions and multiple smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. And I'm gonna get more into the software architecture of what is happening in a dApp on the back end in a later video, but we're gonna keep it high level for right now and just look at what a user sees. This multi-call was the swap transaction. It went from pending to confirmed 
faster than I could even uh, go into the, the wallet. And now you can see that I've exchanged some ETH for DAI right here. So the last thing I want to talk about is how similar this Web3 decentralized app looks compared to the normal Web2 apps that we uh, use on a day-to-day -day basis, like Facebook, Instagram, and all of that. So really, I mean, the, the two differences on the front end are that in Web2, you have a username and password, and Web3, you have, you're using your wallet as your identity, and you're connecting your wallet, and this is kind of logging in to Web3, if you will, okay? So those are two big differences in terms of the UI, but from a visual perspective, it's actually really similar, and this is because the front end technology between Web2 and Web3 are exactly the same, they use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to generate this front-end UI, which the user is going to interact with. The main difference between Web 2 and Web 3 comes in on the back-end. Web 3 uses the blockchain, any blockchain, but we're talking about Ethereum here, as, a, um, as its database and its uh, back-end uh, application logic, okay? So Uniswap is running on smart contracts that were deployed to the Ethereum blockchain, and Web2 is being run through a company's um, centralized server. So when you um, access Facebook, you are accessing their server, you're making HTTP requests to their server, and, um, and all of that application logic is happening from that centralized server. Whereas in Web3, the application logic and database is decentralized on the blockchain. So I wanted to explain why at a surface level, these things look very similar, but the backend blockchain it grants properties to Web3 apps, to dApps, that Web2 can never do. And this is why there's so much focus on Web3 right now. So that is it in terms of the, the first several videos. I've explained the, basically the onboarding journey to get into the Web3 ecosystem. And the next several videos in this series, now I'm going to go a little bit more in depth to give you some technical background on what is happening when you, are, when you send transactions from your wallet or when you connect to the dApp. What does the dApp look like on the back end specifically? What is that software architecture? So I'm not going to get too technically detailed. I'm not a software developer myself, so don't worry. I'm going to keep it very simple to these emoji looking diagrams here. But I want to give enough technical detail to where you can be an effective designer in Web3. Just to build some solid mental models and not get too in depth, but enough to have a solid understanding of what's happening so you can design and speak about these things effectively. Thank you guys.